120 pound gear. And it's very aware that it is establishing a corpus, a body of understanding about Jesus that is intended to be passed on into the future. Scholars suggest that the Gospel of John was actually written by a community that had been practicing and worshiping and growing and collectively articulated these kind of memory stories of Jesus in order to help the next generation connect with and understand the story of Jesus. And so it's the week after Easter, and I always land with the three questions. What, so what, now what? And I think this is the question for Thomas. What happened? What does it mean? And what am I supposed to do about it? What, so what, now what? And the what is that Jesus is risen. He's been resurrected. So what? I think sometimes this question is actually hard for us to answer. Um, I'll tell you, my son has been coming up to me lately, and he's been saying, why did Jesus die for us? He's four. I want you to think about how hard that question is to answer to a four-year-old in very concrete and real terms. It's exceedingly difficult to answer, let me put it that way. But I think that the thing that I say to him is Jesus was trying to welcome people into a world where they could trust each other. And people killed him because they didn't believe that they could trust each other. And there's a lot of great kids movies that bring up the same point. You've got Raya and the Last Dragon, where Sisu the dragon comes and decides to trust this woman who's the princess of this kind of enemy kingdom. And of course, incidents happen and the dragon gets killed and falls into the water. And there's a resurrection story later, so you've got a very on-the-nose Jesus story. Same thing happens in Frozen 2. There's a, a young woman, Elsa, who's magical, who's going to uh, find out the truth about her past and liberate the, the lies of the past. And of course, then she gets trapped and frozen, and of course, there's a nice resurrection story there, and everything ends up fine. Um, the, the thing about our Easter story is that Jesus isn't around anymore. He keeps, like, popping up and surprising us, but then tells us, like, you've got the Spirit now. We're not going to be here anymore. In these other stories, there's this kind of after place where these heroes are now around in perpetuity, we assume. But our story isn't that way. And I, I feel like Thomas might kind of know this. He might, have, he might be remembering the things that Jesus said while he was alive, about how he wasn't going to be here forever. In John's Gospel, there's a lot of teaching that Jesus does about the Advocate, the one who's going to come to lead us and guide us and teach us into the future. And you can tell that Jesus is setting up this expectation, I'm not going to be here forever. And that's where a lot of the pushback from the disciples comes. And so I feel like Thomas is really asking this question, is this for real? Is there really life after this death and this loss? Or was this just a feeling that I had? Was this just a moment in time? I was at a festival, I was feeling funky, everybody's my friend. And then I go back home, and I go back to my work life, and it just kind of is a memory, a thing that's not really real to me anymore. And so he, he, he asks for this encounter with the resurrected Christ, because he needs to be able to trust that there is some kind of life after this death. There is some life in his name has meaning aside from just this kind of experience that they had this one time. Does anybody know what the, uh, the legends of Thomas are? Like what happened to Thomas? He's the patron saint of India. The kind of modern understanding, well, I mean, modern understandings, the, the legend is, and there's not really a lot of evidence to dispute this, is that from here, from Jerusalem, he travels all the way across the Eurasian continent and ends up in the Indian subcontinent on the coast planting churches. And then he gets there by 52 
uh, CE, and he lives for 20 years, and he dies in 72. And he evangelizes India. And actually, there's a bunch of Jewish communities there, so there's people that have connections to the story, uh, the stories of the Hebrew God. And he comes and teaches them about Jesus. And so there's a whole uh, significant uh, kind of corpus of legend and tale and so forth about St. Thomas in India that kind of manifests the Indian Christian movement. And if that's true, I just think about how brave he must have been in order to go and do that, to leave Jerusalem, the place that seemed like it was the logical and obvious place to stay and preach the gospel, and to travel so far across the world into a completely foreign space in order to do this work. And I think about, okay, what's the lesson here? What's the lesson of Thomas? I wonder if we really believe that redemption is real. And I'm just going to make sure I clarify that when I talk about redemption, I don't mean somehow that, uh, that Jesus had to die for our sins so that we could be in okay with God, that we could be in right relationship with God, and we couldn't be without that. Redemption doesn't work that way, right? Redemption is about giving something value, about seeing something as valuable. You can think about this, I've talked about this before, about coupons, right? The pile of junk mail in your living room, on the floor next to where the mail comes in, or wherever you keep that stuff, has absolutely no value until you cut it out and take it into the store, and then all of a sudden, that thing gives you two bucks off if you spend ten dollars on it, right? It, it gets value. That's what redeeming something means. And so for Thomas, the death of Jesus has now been redeemed because there's a sense of life. And I think that probably Thomas's life, his commitment to Jesus and his commitment to following the way has been redeemed because now he sees the way past this death. And then I think a lot of Christian tradition and history teaches us that when we encounter the risen Christ, when we encounter that redeemed experience, it almost always leads us to a sense of call, a sense of new purpose. Now, it's easy for Thomas because he's just a preacher preaching the word about Jesus being liberated, or redeemed, or resurrected, or however you want to say it. And so his call is very obvious, right? You have this encounter with Jesus, you go tell people about your encounter with Jesus, you go help them have an encounter with Jesus. And so a lot of times we can read these stories and say, well, if I'm not called to be a preacher or a pastor or a priest, then this story doesn't have anything to do with me. That, you know, if I'm not out there trying to evangelize and proselytize, then so what? And is that what I'm supposed to do? Is that what I'm supposed to take away from all of this? Well, I think there's a lot of ways to preach the gospel. I think... The gospel is, is this thing that's a bit bigger than each particular way that we tell the story. That for me, the point is, is that we experience transformation, we experience liberation, we experience redemption, and then we go out there and we encounter other people and we invite them to a sense of redemption, a sense of self-worth, a sense of value, and we communicate with every person we meet just to your prayer's point that this person in front of us is a beloved child of God. And we can do that in all kinds of ways, in every facet of our life. That if we experience God's love and transformation, and we abide in it, and we learn how to love ourselves and our bodies exactly as we are, and not wanting things to be different, not wanting some part of us to be changed so that we can be good enough, but say we're good enough already, then out of that, I believe, will come this sense of call. Sometimes we try to force it, we try to skip it, skip a step, but I think there's something that comes out of it. And so I want to offer up a name to you. How many of you have ever heard of Jeffrey Marsh? No? Okay, 
Jeffrey Marsh is a non-binary person who is a big internet sensation. Uh, has been for a number of years. They use Twitch and TikTok and so forth. And their primary ministry is to talk to their 10-year-old self and tell their 10-year-old self, it's going to be okay. You are loved exactly as you are. You don't need to fit into the binary. You don't need to be worried about what other people think. That in fact, you being exactly who you are and you loving yourself will be liberative for everybody around you. And they are amazing because they are a person that is showing the world how to receive horrible, horrible, violent vitriol, just nasty comments and derisive and derogatory and hurtful things. And how to just receive and hold that and reflect love back to that person. So if you haven't looked them up, I encourage you to Google Jeffrey Marsh and just watch a couple of their videos. Because they do an absolutely masterful job at sneaky Jesus in people, right? People are coming, ready to combat and ready to argue, ready to tell them that there's something wrong with them, that they're just performing or pretending that they just want attention. And so many times, Jeffrey is able to invite them to see how their reaction is coming out of their pain and their harm and helps really to redeem them. It's beautiful. It's beautiful work. They wrote a book that's called How to Love Yourself. That's the name of it. And basically, like, it's part like book and it's part self, like part memoir, part self help book, and then part workbook. And really, the invitation is how can you start loving yourself right now? And how can you actually believe that loving yourself right now is a part of the radical transformation of the whole world? I think sometimes we think that that work, that inner work, our self work, is should be secondary to our work out in the world, right? There's something wrong with Thomas for needing this redemption experience before he goes out and does all this work that he does. But I'm not sure that we can really serve people with an honest heart. I don't think we can really love people the way that they want and need to be loved if we can't figure out how to love ourselves first how to ask for what we need, how to pray to God, how to experience redemption and personal value. And I think in doing that, what I've learned from the little bit I've learned about Jeffrey is that in just being their full and authentic and vibrant, welcoming self, that that has this effect on the world. It has this effect on the people that are It changes things. And so I'm curious with you, have you had enough experience of trustworthy confirmation of your faith, of knowing that you are the love of God? Are you still seeking one out, or have you had one already? And if you've had it, one of the big challenges of that is are we trusting it, or are we questioning it? Are we questioning it, or are we avoiding it? Is there some way that we're not really embracing this sense of our own value? And I think about this for me, because sometimes I think that it's getting in the way of me doing the work that I'm called to do. You know, if you're called to do something big and powerful and profound, sometimes you can shy away from it by saying, well, I'm not the really person to do that. You know, I'm not really. I don't, I don't think that's my work. I think about Thomas and his work of evangelizing India. Like, what if he sat there and said, well, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not really sure that it was Jesus. I'm not really sure that he wants us to go do this work. I'm not really sure that the Holy Spirit is operating in the world. Uh, I'm not really sure that I'm redeemed. I'm not really sure that I'm an agent of God. I'm not really sure that my life is of value. How many times can that stop us from doing the big, profound work that we're called to do? How many times can that stop us from loving and offering and honoring and moving into the world? 
See, the Easter story is a story that we are called to remember. Not just because it happened a long time ago, but because there's something about the encounter with the resurrected Christ. There's something about the encounter with the overcoming of the forces of death and destruction, the forces of separation and isolation, that they came back together, and if you showed up in that room, probably scared the Jesus out of them. But then said, you know, I need, I answer prayer. I'll meet you wherever you are. But I can't let you stay here. We've got things to do. We've got people that need to learn about their own value. Have you, have you had trustworthy confirmation of yours or not that you can be my agent in the world? Have you learned that you matter so that we can go teach others? We're called to remember because we're called to